kind of big high level picture at the moment. We've got the right kinds of things happening, I think. Um, the blueprint for a public service reform talks about how we need to be more citizen centred, we need to retain some of those traditional public service values that are important as we move into this new realm, being frank and fearless and the like. And we need to move towards being risk averse and becoming willing to engage with risk. And there's also the innovation work as well, and how we can borrow some of those ideas. So there's also the Government 2.0 Task Force, which I don't need to talk about because most people here are familiar with that, and the Declaration of Open Government. And so the way some of the senior people from Prime Minister and Cabinet have been talking about this as they've gone out on the road to try and engage with people about it is these things are your license for change, it's your mandate to change things. But so how do we get from Okay, this is what we've in theory been asked to do, to changing the workplace culture that we all encounter and can often be a little bit disheartening in some experiences because it's easy to talk about these things but it's hard to do them. So I just want to quickly run through four quite simple, hopefully practical ideas that I've come across that we can potentially use to each as individuals here take small steps towards changing the culture in our agencies playing our own small part, um, and then I'm keen to hear other ideas that people might have or experiences they've had um, in how you can take small steps towards changing culture. So one thing I think that's important is getting, before we can take practical action, getting in principle agreement. Um, and sometimes you may find it's quite easy if you're in a planning process for your branch's 12-month plan or setting a policy proposal forward you can hopefully look for ways to include, may only be one sentence, but get something in there that then someone senior reads and understands but then signs off that gives in principle agreement to do some of those things because that can then be quite powerful to point back to and say, hey, look, we've actually all signed up to do this. Um, and one example in our own department at the moment, Department of Broadband, which has been quite useful, is the department's corporate plan actually says our department will be leaders of the public service in using government 2.0 tools and social media and these kind of things. And so that's, I've found, been quite powerful in terms of something I can pick up and point to when I'm speaking with um, senior colleagues in the department to say, look, I think it is worth investing the money and the time in this. Sure, there may be some risks, but we can identify and manage it. So that's the first thing. Try and look for ways to get in principle agreement to do some of these things and then hold people to them, hopefully. Second thing is committing to improve your own interpersonal communication skills. I think we all kind of agree that, you know, this government took on our agenda about openness, about engagement, and about using technology that is important. And it can be quite easy, I think, to say, ah, oh, the culture here, they just don't get it, and, you know, I've tried explaining it to them, but people just don't get it, and so the culture's against it, so let's just be like. But how can we all become better communicators to sell this message better? Um, particularly if anyone's worked in a sales role or a business development role, hopefully you've encountered some of these kinds of principles. But one of the best resources out there, I've found it's quite useful, is a website called changingminds.org. And they've got heaps of great resources there, um, covering things like how to be really good. Elevator speech, which you may have encountered if you've watched venture capitalists trying to get some funding for a good idea. I think it's broadly similar for us in our own agencies trying to pitch some of these messages. Um, they've got interesting ideas from advertising and marketing that you can use. Um, hopefully there's some good substance behind the ideas that we're pitching as well. But there's some good, good stuff there about how to give a good presentation. Um, Changingminds.org is that website. Um, another third area is routines. So um, culture can be influenced by routine. So I think as John mentioned, if a cabinet submission comes forward that talks about these things and that can become routinized, um, all the better. And so for instance, your agency may have a template for doing a communication strategy and put in there, in that template, that people need to address this. So even those people who are not so familiar will be forced to think about it. And the fourth idea I wanted to put out there is finding 
low effort ways to engage some of the people in your agency who may be skeptics or not familiar with some of these things to get involved in the process. So for example, the Park of Broadband has a fairly active Twitter account and initially that was started off just by um, one or two people who were you know, on Twitter themselves and very keen. But since then we've been trying to expand that out and get more people involved in the process, more people suggesting tweets, even if they don't use Twitter themselves. And so, as I'm sure you may have found, if you've tried communicating to people who don't use Twitter about what it is, it can be a bit scary and daunting and very confusing. Um, I still get confused by it myself. But so how do you engage people from your agency, which may be very large, um, probably there's lots of people who don't use Twitter. And so what we've found is some people will want to get involved in it and learn more about it. So for those people you can have something that says, look, this is when to use a hashtag that already, already exists. This is when you may want to make up your own hashtag. But for the vast majority of people, um, as Stephen said in his talk earlier, um, they've got actual work to do that you know, is keeping them busy. So how can we find low effort ways for those people to get involved as well? And that's where you want to look for ways, for instance, you, know, you don't need to write a tweet, you can just email someone who's on the Twitter team, they'll help you. You can just phone up, you don't need to be an expert yourself. Um, so look for those low effort ways to involve people who are new, and that way you can expand the circle of people who are involved. So that's a few ways to, in practical terms, move the culture. Um, but I'm keen to hear what other experiences people have about taking some small steps towards culture change in their own workplace or any other ideas that people might have. I just came down stairs from Steve Davis' talk about um, the idea for a culture app, which sounds pretty cool. Um, does anyone else have any examples or ideas they have that are interesting about shaping culture? Yeah, I, I, I think there's an elephant in the room. I'd just like to read something that I wrote a few months ago because it's, it's the most succinct way of saying what I want to say. The ACT Public Service Management Act, which is public the ACT public, declares a public employee shall, in performing his or her duty, not make a comment that he or she is not authorised to make, where the comment may be expected to be taken to be an official comment. The implications of these restrictions for the participation of governments in projects online should not be underestimated. It is very unlikely that any online participant so restricted could, could ever participate effectively in tribal business and in tribal authority online. It is important to understand that these restrictions are about risk management in an environment of adversarial government or an opposition ready to maximise the political damage of every facility failure. The media hungry for emotive content and the citizenry often driven by its own litigious sense of entitlement. Every public word uttered by a government official officer is a potential risk to career and government embarrassment. I think that's the elephant in the room. Yeah. Yeah, I was just well, a couple of points. One, but also um, I think it's very important what the leadership team thinks. I mean, I really think that culture is, yes, it can be, you know, um, lobbied for and and swell up, if you like, through demand. But I really do believe strongly that whoever the leader is puts it out there, you know, allows it to happen, that leadership team. But on that particular point, I think um, this is where protocols and procedures come into play. I mean, obviously, we wouldn't go to the Cambridge Times in this case or any other media outlet and make a, make a statement about something we're doing um, that's that's um, commercial incompetence for whoever we're working for. You just don't do that. But if there might be, a, if I have heard, I mean, there might be a, a more public forum or something like that that you can tweet that. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I think we need to be careful of not using it as an excuse because it's yeah. very easy to say oh, it's too hard or yeah, yeah. there's yeah. rules against it. Yeah. And just, and um, I'm going to profoundly disagree with the gentleman at the front here. Yeah. I think, Good. I think, um, and I, look, um, those of you who know me know I've been doing this stuff a long time. Um, I think there's nothing that 
stopping us from participating actively and appropriately, and that's the thing that we're, we're, this is where the government bit comes in from the senior management that we have to deal with online, that is not already covered in the public sector government frame, governance framework that we work in. When we sat down, for example, at the centre, where I work now, where I wrote the government 2.0 primer last year for Ajima, two of the things that we chose, or one of the things that we chose to address was the, the, the common question, at what point do I step outside the boundaries? Um, so we have, um, as articulated by the task force, that professional through the personal spectrum, and everything that we put online as a public servant ought to be, we ought to have a moment's thought saying, where does this sit? Is this going to be interpreted professionally, officially or personally? The other thing is, when you, when you sit down for your organisation and you are involved in writing or you are subject to their social media policy, the social media policy should not rewrite all the governance you already exist under, which is the Public Sector Act or the equivalent act of states. It shouldn't, it shouldn't rewrite your um, performance and um, code of conduct materials. And if you operate in that framework, I think you, you're in a position to do good stuff. Here's a, here's a really early on example, back when the, the people around the Canon office in the UK started doing this. What they decided was that for each agency, the people who were engaging online, because they had teams to do this initially, had a scope under which that they, they could discuss the work of their agencies. And the moment the conversation you were having with a member of the public or a member of another agency or a journalist or whatever was going to step over that boundary, you were obligated to say, at this point, I'm about to step over the boundary, and we should all be doing this as public servants, but what I can do for you is put you in contact with the policy or program expert who is the right person to deal with that question, who has the authorisation. And we should be doing that in our work regularly now. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, let's make a quick comment and then go down the map and then here. Um, yeah, I think that's a really powerful framework to use, Steve, is that um, <coughs> three options and be really clear about which one you use, where you're using is which hat am I wearing? Am I wearing my official hat, my professional hat, or my personal hat? And think about that, but also in a lot of situations, as John said earlier, you want to be quite clear about what capacity you're speaking in. Um, and I think that can hopefully address, because um, that, quite but really that said, the average for maybe a fish public service about 45, from the moment they walk in the door, they're given the message to be careful of what they say. Well, that's the way yeah. 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 Um, so I just wanted to say, uh, people um, seem to see social media as much more public than other types of communication and, and essentially people, public servants in all levels of government communicate publicly all the time and, and a lot of that is just governed by the, the code code. I had a discussion once with a, a senior manager um, in local government who said, oh my god, not social media, that would be a disaster, imagine all the terrible things that could happen. And then went on to say that he had been having this running argument with a constituent about it, a thing, a local government thing. He said, and I've just told her really to go jump in the lake because I'm sick of it. There have been 47 emails on this conversation. I've been very rude to her finally because she's been very annoyed. Imagine if that was public. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, and you're right, it's not different. It's public, of course. I mean, and, but there, people just seem to confuse those two things. It, it is no more public. Once it's an email, even a telephone conversation, Absolutely. it's a public thing. So hey, it should be treated differently. Just, I think one of the things that, and one of actually the reasons that I wanted to start GovCamp Australia was because there actually are a lot of precedents that can be set. I think the weapon of, um, of choice for all of us trying to actually progress stuff and for organisations is to look for um, recognised, encouraged precedents because we have so many good precedents that um, help deal with the issue of all about, you know, uh, what about this, what about this. I mean, particularly, you don't look at some of the estimates. I mean, the amount of questions over the last year in some of the estimates around social media has been fascinating and the answers have been incredible. So I actually have the Secretary of the Department say, um, yes, all these people use social media and our policy is that we trust them to do the right thing, but of course we monitor it and if they do the wrong thing, we we'll pull them up. That's an amazing precedent. So you can take that to the Secretary of the Department and say blah, blah, blah. So um, I think that one of the best things we as a community can do is try to track and keep an eye on the different precedents and use that as our, um, as our rationale and risk mitigation mechanism to, to say why we can do things. Because all the risk, because uh, really that's all it comes down to is risk mitigation. If people feel that the box is a text, and the risk mitigation strategies in place, then you have to do stuff. Thanks. Mark? 
Well, in fact, the Australian Public Service Commission does have guidelines on social media use, so at the federal level, those principles are there. 